Welcome to the Servants of Grace podcast hosted by Dave Jenkins. Our podcast exists to provide trustworthy expository messages through the Bible and faithful answers to your theology questions. Now for today's episode, let's join our host, Dave Jenkins. Welcome to a brand new Servants of Grace Theology segment. My name is Dave, and I'm the host for this podcast. And today, one of our listeners writes in, and they have a great question. The question is this. What does it mean that God is not mocked? Well, you see, when it comes to sowing and reaping, the scripture in Galatians 6, 7 says, Do not be deceived. The deception it has in mind is one of the most popular falsehoods of our times. It is a lie that I can do whatever I want without ever being held accountable for what I have done. It is a lie that I can sin with impunity no matter what I do now. I can always become a spiritual person later. It is a lie, wrote the Scotsman John Brown, that a man may attain ultimate happiness without living a spiritual life. Make no mistake, Galatians 6-7 says God is not mocked. To put it more literally, we cannot turn our noses up up at God. We cannot despise him by displeasing our sinful nature and then sneering at him whenever we get the chance. At least we cannot do these things and get away with them. People who think that they can fool with God are only fooling themselves. No one can flout his authority forever. One day we will reap what we have sown, and if we sow to please a sinful nature, we will reap destruction. Now many people have tried to mock God, But no one has ever gotten away with it. Goliath mocked God's kingdom when the Philistines fought the Jews in the valley of Allah, and he shook his fist at the armies of the living God. But you see, God cannot be mocked, and so Goliath ends up with a stone in his forehead and a sword through his neck. King Herod mocked God's glory when people proclaimed that he was a god. Herod sat on his throne in shimmering silver robes, basking in the glow of his people's worship. But you see, God cannot be mocked. Because he refused to give God the glory, Harry was eaten by worms and he died. And now people will go on mocking God and his judgment until the very day that Christ returns. But you see, there will be a harvest. And Jesus spoke of this in Matthew 13, 39-42, saying this, The harvest is a close of the age, and the reapers are angels. Just as the weeds are gathered and burned with fire, so will it be at the close of the age. The Son of Man will send his angels, and there they will gather out of his kingdom all causes of sin and all lawbreakers, and throw them into the fiery furnace. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. So you see, if you think you can get away with what you're doing, you're badly mistaken. God cannot be mocked. But there's more than one way to sow, and thankfully the seeds of destruction are not the only seeds that we can sow. Good seed is available. And when it's sown in fertile seed field, it yields a rich harvest. Galatians 6, 8 says, The one who sows to the Spirit will from the Spirit reap eternal life. And you see the idea of sowing and reaping, it takes readers back to Galatians 6, 6, which is about sharing good things with the minister. And one way to sow to the Spirit is support the ministry of God's Word. Up through the time of the Reformers, this is how this passage was usually interpreted. But sowing to the Spirit also means much more than providing for one's pastor. It's another way of describing what Paul was talking about earlier when he mentioned about walking with the Spirit in Galatians 5.16, being led by the Spirit in Galatians 5.18, and keeping in step with the Spirit in Galatians 5.25. Sowing to the Spirit means following the Spirit's lead, obeying His instructions for holy living. So you see, Sowing to the Spirit means sowing the kind of seed that comes from the fruit of the Spirit. Love, joy, kindness, faithfulness, and so on and so forth. It means cultivating good spiritual fruit by using the means of grace, Bible study, prayer, worship, and the sacraments. Sowing to the Spirit means living for God's pleasure instead of our own pleasure. So, for example, a young couple sows to the Spirit when they preserve the purity of their marriage bed. A man sows to the Spirit when he denies his own ambition and serves others instead. A woman sows to the Spirit when she is reconciled to her sister in Christ. 
a man and wife sowed to the Spirit when they repent of their selfishness and they begin to work together in true spiritual partnership. In short, sowing to the Spirit means living for Christ in every area and in every phase of life. Every time we think a thought, speak a word, or perform a deed, we plant a seed. And every time we think, say, or do anything for God's glory, we are sowing to His Spirit. And so if it's true that we reap what we sow, then the more that we sow, the more we reap. The seed we sow to the Spirit may be scattered just as widely. 2 Corinthians 9, 6 says, Whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and whoever sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. You see, whoever sows to the Spirit reaps the wealthiest harvest of all, eternal life. This does not mean that salvation comes by works. That's not what we're talking about here. Eternal life is a gift that is based on believing, not on doing. Believers are doers, and although no one is ever saved by works, no one is ever saved without them either. And therefore, having been saved by grace, the believer goes on to sow, goes on and sows to please the Spirit. And God, in His grace, will give the reward of eternal life to everyone who sows good spiritual seed. The Scripture teaches that the one who has the power to impart eternal life is the Holy Spirit alone. It is from the Spirit that believers will reap eternal life, Galatians 6, 8. Eternal life is God's gift to everyone who believes in God the Son, Jesus Christ. John 3, 16 says, For God so loved the world that He gave His only Son, that whoever believes in Him should not perish but have eternal life. But you see, the one who grants the gift of life without end is the Spirit. And whereas sowing to the flesh brings nothing but death and destruction, sowing to the Spirit produces eternal life. The glorious life of the immortal resurrection body comes from God's Spirit, the same Spirit who raised Christ from the dead or raised the Christian from the dead. And in some ways, eternal life has already begun. Those who sow to please the Spirit begin to reap His rewards already in this life. And in this respect, spiritual harvesting is like picking blueberries. When a family goes out to gather berries, they gather enough to last until the next harvest. But not all the berries make it into the pies and the jellies. Now and then, one of the harvesters picks up juicy blueberry, tosses it into his mouth, and eats it right away. You see, we begin to taste eternal life as soon as we come to Christ. Everyone who is born again by God's Spirit has a life of the eternal God within. In his Galatians commentary, Baptist theologian Timothy George explains that eternal life is not merely life that lasts eternally. It is rather God's very own life, the life of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, graciously bestowed upon the children of God through faith in the Redeemer. Eternal life is the present possession of all who trust in Christ as Savior and Lord. And therefore, not all the benefits of eternal life are deferred. The Holy Spirit assures us of our faith, the joy of our salvation, and the hope of our resurrection right here and now. The Spirit also gives us something to look forward to. We are waiting for the promised harvest of the life to come. All through this life, we sow our seeds to please the Spirit, knowing that one day we will reap a bumper crop of God's blessing. William Perkins, in his commentary on Galatians, writes, If men could be persuaded of this, that the time of this life is a seed time, that the last judgment is the harvest, and that as certainly as husbandsman, which sows his seed, looks for increase, so we for our works, are our compass to the full, oh, how fruitful we should be, how plentiful, how full, of good works. Well, I want to thank you for listening to this episode of the Servants of Grace Theology segment. Until next time, may the Lord richly bless you and keep you. Thank you for listening to the Servants of Grace podcast today. If you enjoyed the show, please subscribe leave a rating on the app, and share our episode with your friends and family. If you'd like to, you can follow us on Instagram at Servants of Grace, on Twitter at Servants of Grace, or by searching Servants of Grace on Facebook. You can also find this podcast on the front page of our website at servantsofgrace.org.